Good, well, actually, good morning um, to every <laughs> to, <laughs> to everybody who's joining us from the United States. Um, I say good afternoon um, to everybody who's joining us um, from Berlin and from Europe, and good evening to everybody who joins us from the other side um, of the world. Um, it is a particular pleasure um, welcoming you to our event today, um, our event uh, on In Science We Trust, which we are organizing together with our partner 3M. Um, Jokingly, I could say, since this is a transatlantic and also an English event, I should say 3M, but um, it is 3M. Um, and I want to start us off with a quote, and it goes as follows. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. Do you know who said that? Anybody? Ah, very good, very good. I picked something which is new to you. It is Marie Curie um, who said this um, about science. And I think this is a wonderful kickoff um, for our event because we want to understand more um, of our perceptions on science, how science is perceived, how we communicate science, how science is communicated, um, and what we could maybe um, do better. And let me ask you a couple more questions. The first one is, do you think that your life would look differently without science? Don't say anything, just think about it. Do you think your life would be different without science? And write it down, write it down for yourself if your answer is yes, no, or maybe. And the second question I want to ask you is, do you often think about science? Don't say anything, just write it down. Yes, no, or maybe. Do you often think about science? And the answers to those two questions and many, many more um, are provided in a study, in a poll, um, which was done um, and conducted and commissioned by 3M. And, um, I want, would like to introduce um, our first speaker who is going to introduce that study to, to us, Yaishri Seid. And Yaishri, you are, um, I would say you are an amazing woman, um, to cut it short, <laughs> because you are a scientist. Um, you um, have a um, background, a PhD in chemical engineering from Clarkson University in New York. You are an innovator, um, you are a scientist, you are a maker, um, you are a leader, you are a role model. Um, and you are, um, your position as corporate scientist as 3M and chief science advocate. Um, and um, it's, it's amazing looking at what you have achieved. Um, I can only recommend looking um, at uh, also your Wikipedia entrance um, there you can see what awards uh, she was awarded. Um, and now we would like to hear what you found in your study and what it also means to be a chief science advocate and why we actually need that at all. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, guten Tag. I truly wish I was there in person, but the world has changed a bit, let's just say. And I'm excited to get the opportunity to, uh, let me see here, I'm gonna forward my slide to present virtually. Um, but before we, I guess, talk about the state of science, uh, something that you said made me think about uh, that we should acknowledge the past 18 months we have had. Uh, truly unprecedented times uh, in many ways, you know, virtually all of humanity facing the same existential crisis, confronting the same fears, and we all awaited our turn for the same gift of science uh, in the vaccine. So there's no doubt in my mind uh, the answer to your questions. And science will eventually vanquish COVID-19. But during the pandemic, it was a great opportunity to study what the general public thinks about science. So let me ask you a question as well. What do you think about what the general public thinks about science? Are they seeing it in a more positive light? or a more negative light. 
It's a good question, right? In fact, it's so tricky that depending on what is going on in the outside world and where in the world you are, you can convince yourself either way. So again, just like Stormy said, write it down because we tested this hypothesis and science is truly having its moment. And that is exactly why it is a great time for us to advocate for science. Uh, let me explain what is going on. Science skepticism declined for the first time in 2020, and it has stayed low in 2021. It's the lowest since we started tracking with 3M State of Science Index four years ago. And as you can see, skepticism was steadily rising till before the pandemic. But with the pandemic, it went down and trust in science and scientists is the highest it has been. So now you're probably thinking, good to know, you're comparing with what you wrote down when Stormy asked you these questions. Good to know that science is being seen in a positive light, but you have all these questions. I know you have these questions. Well, wait a minute. Why is, how do you say that, 3M, 3M company doing these surveys? So let me back up a bit and quickly give you a little background. So this is our sustainability framework at 3M. And people like me, I go to work every day with the sustainability value commitment we have. My projects connect up to science for circular, science for climate, and science for community. And in that community pillar, we are committed to creating a more positive world with science, and we work towards the sustainability development goals. And we have a long-standing commitment to education and STEM equity in all the communities that we operate in around the world. Because at 3M, we are all about science. It is our most distinguishing characteristic. It is what uh, ties our businesses together. And it's the foundational strength behind our brand, science applied to life. So we care about science, science matters to us, and we wanted to understand what the global perception around science was, the kind of questions that Stormy asked. And we didn't find any studies that were relatively recent and global in nature, so we went ahead and commissioned one, and that's how this was born. We surveyed 14 countries in mid-2017, 1,000 respondents per country, and the results have been really interesting and let's just say thought-provoking. We wanted to understand what the public perception was. We really made a real in understanding of what the world thinks about science. So for instance, the first year we did the survey, four out of 10 people globally said, if science didn't exist, their lives would be no different. And I repeat, you heard me right. If science didn't exist, their lives would be no different, they said. And 32% of the people called themselves science skeptics. And in this population, 60%, six out of 10 said, if science didn't exist, their lives would be no different. And I see many of you shaking your heads. Now get this, they were taking the survey on there. Uh-huh, their laptops or mobile phones. So yes, you can pick your jaw off the floor. It's very clear that science was invisible, science was underappreciated, and science was taken for granted. And that is the problem. People don't realize that all this wonderful technology that they so seem to enjoy the benefits of, you know, our phones, cars, microwaves, uh, coffee machines first thing in the morning, that it is fundamental science and research and application that allowed them to afford these benefits. So that's an, one interesting data point. Some of the other things that people around the globe say, I was more excited about science as a child. And many say as an adult, I don't think there is a need for me to understand science. 36% of those surveyed also said only geniuses can have a career in science. So thank you, Albert Einstein, but no thanks, because who do you think? Who do you think a label like this, a label of genius will actually deter the most? Exactly those who are underrepresented in many STEM fields. And no surprise actually, across the globe, women trailed men in the positive sentiment for science. In fact, when asked if you could have a satisfying career in engineering, 25% of the men agreed, but for women, it was only 9%. And I stand before you, um, wait a minute, actually I'm sitting. So I sit before you as an engineer, certainly not a genius by any means and with a very satisfying career in STEM. So we know we have work ahead of us, not just in science perception, but in advocacy. But interestingly, 
looks like deep down people knew that it is important for our future because even in our 2018 results around the world, Germany included, people wanted the next generation to pursue science. Interesting, isn't it? I don't care about science, not so important for me, but you go ahead, little kids, you do science. How does that work? It kind of doesn't. I know as a parent, and those of you who are parents understand that the kids are watching what you do and not what you say. So although it's great to see people want their kids to know more about science and have careers in science, we have our work cut out as it relates to advocating for it, especially if the general population doesn't seem to be that aware of it and appreciate it as much. So these are just some of the results from the first round. There's a lot more there, but it was clear that science needs advocates. Science needs more champions. And it was clear that this was not some data that 3M could keep close to our West. This was something that needed to be shared and we needed to foster a global conversation around this topic. And I was called upon to be the company's first ever chief science advocate. And when I got the call, uh, my first reaction was, who me? I can't do this. Because truth be told, all along while I was growing up, I never thought of myself as the science and engineering type. I was just strongly encouraged by my parents to go into the field. Of course, first when this came about, I questioned everything. Uh, what is this data? Where did we survey? How did you define science? Let me see all of that. Who did you ask? Who exactly did you ask? Blah, 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 and all these other questions. And quickly I realized that the problem is real because the people are simply reacting to whatever their perception of science is and perception is reality as they say, right? So we do have to do work on this perception. And then it kind of all started falling together for me, my own journey, my own perception of STEM fields when I was growing up, as well as my experiences in raising my own kids. I have a son and a daughter and I've noticed the difference between the two and I took this role on and I'm really glad I did. So the first thing as an engineer, I broke down the problem into A, B, and C. A is about raising awareness and appreciation and acknowledgement of science so we can move away from this sort of apathy. Second area is of course, breaking down the biases, the barriers, the boundaries, and the beliefs. You know, I'm not a genius. I can't do science, right brain, left brain. I'm a girl, science is not for me. These are all issues, right? We see the portrayal of science in the media. And, and just as an example, despite having two PhD scientists at home, my daughter said, I don't wanna do science, that's for geeks, you know, mommy. So the image of nerds and loners and mavericks and evil and always male scientists in media isn't gonna inspire little girls. So that needs to be addressed and it's happening slowly. And finally, we have to focus on the context and champion and communicate that scientists solve problems, science can improve lives. I know from my own experience how important that context was to my daughter, whereas that content was sufficient to motivate my son. So with girls, we need to put a different lens on for communicating about STEM education and careers. And I know it was certainly needed for me when I was growing up because I could not make that connection. So um, that's me, uh, the science of makeup and lighting. And I love this picture because my daughter thought it was really cool. So the, for the first time she said something cool about a scientist. Uh, so you can access this website, 3m.com slash science index and see all the results from the previous years because now I'm gonna start going into more recent data. So basically in 2019, we then dug deeper into somewhat of the shocking results that we got. And what we found out is that people do realize that science is important for our future, but they would like scientists to communicate in a way that is more understandable. So, you know, just as I suspected, it is a focus on the context and telling a story, not just rattling off facts and evidence and data. And that may work well, perhaps within peers, but certainly not for the public. Uh, many also thought that scientists are elitist, you know, so, so as, as practitioners, it is our responsibility to actively work on that image as well, because for the sake of our field, it is essential. So what we did at 3M as these results become, became available is we started focusing on some of this across the spectrum of what we do. And I'm gonna give you a sampling here, some of the things that we did. Uh, we compiled a scientist as so storyteller's guide. It has tips from many uh, you know, uh, well-known SciComm folks and they talk about some powerful concepts as it relates to science communication. And that's actually me and Janet in the lab holding up one of my favorite tape products. You know, We all love 3M tapes. Uh, this guide is actually downloadable from the 3M website, so check it out if you are interested. We also hosted a podcast series, and here we just pick apart the results of the survey. Then we also did a video series called Beyond the Beaker, 
And in this one, we, di uh, you know, sort of profile diverse 3M scientists as everyday people. You know, people have the same interests and passions and hopes and desires to show that they are real people. And we had to do that because of the data that we unheard by the State of Science Index that said that scientists are elitist. And I speak at a lot of events to take this message to the world and share the results of the survey. We also pull in celebrities to amplify the message. And I also write a lot. So please follow me on LinkedIn. And if the message resonates, please help us to amplify these messages. So for instance, I write about topics such as science advocacy and what I have learned in my journey that we need to make the connection of science to everyday life for people to appreciate it and keep it in the forefront. Otherwise it's taken for granted. We also need to make uh, science feel more of a human endeavor as opposed to some strange um, ivory tower thing because we can't have this chasm with the general public. It'll be an issue when we need the public to follow science and we see how that has even played out now uh, and finally, it is important to keep talking about STEM and encourage that exposure and education. And then I also talk about the multifaceted issue of uh, girls in STEM and uh, women in STEM. You know, there are issues across the spectrum. There's the social conditioning, the cultural, the psychological, uh, to early education influences, to STEM in college, STEM professionals, how we need more role models, how we need to change the way it is taught, communicate that it solves problems and you can help others. And the way I like to say it is it's time for steam cleaning. S is for shattering of stereotypes. T is for telling the wholesome story about science. E is for providing exposure and environment. A is for allies and advocates. We need, need men to be allies here because it's not a zero sum game. We will all benefit from it. And finally, M is for metrics and measures. Listen, without that, unfortunately, sometimes change just doesn't happen. Numbers don't move, especially in many corporate and institutional environments. So we at 3M, for example, we have set diversity goals and it's a great thing because the public expects that. We saw it in our 2020 results. So by now you're wondering. And now if you're wondering uh, whether we did the survey in 2020, yes, we did. Uh, we built upon our 2018 and 2019 learnings and the results came in right before the pandemic. And honestly, once the pandemic was raging, uh, the world as we know it completely changed and in, changed in so many ways. And it just became a unique opportunity to get another pulse during the pandemic. So in 2020, we actually released two sets of results, one before the pandemic, and then a pandemic pulse taken during the pandemic. And then we fielded one in 2021 as pandemic was turning the corner with vaccines becoming more available. So now let's go over some of the 2020 and 2021 highlights, which are very much influenced by the pandemic and the fact that we have vaccines. So I should point out, if you want to look at the data at leisure, it's all available on our website, 3m.com slash science index. And the 2021 themes are very consistent with the themes that emerged in 2020. So in 2020, during the pandemic, the global public survey said, we need to follow the science to get out of the pandemic. And they said that there are negative consequences if people don't value science. And these numbers really tell a great story. By 2021, with vaccines around the corner, there was hope. And that hope fostered trust. It was at the highest level. And in Germany also, it was seven points higher compared to pre-pandemic levels. You know, I will defend science when someone questions it. Those kinds of things became very strong. People very, became very aware of the impact science was gonna have. Also became aware of environmental sustainability challenges and recognized the role of science. And the numbers for Germany reflect that too. And as far as the pandemic making people more environmentally conscious, uh, we often get together and discuss and try to rationalize some of this data. The data is what it is. And we feel that Germany is already very aware of sustainability challenges, and they really didn't need the pandemic to make them more aware of the challenges. That's how we have rationalized that number there, which says, has the pandemic made you more environmentally conscious? Globally, it's at 77%, with Germany, it's at 58%. So that's something that we could perhaps discuss later on. And all this data really makes for good discussion because the data is what it is. And as far as the expectations go, the global public understands the value and expects more scientific collaboration to solve societal challenges. The numbers for Germany are very representative of the global average. 
And in 2020 itself, the one big thing we started seeing was the renewed interest in STEM. People saw what science can do. People saw what STEM fields and careers and practitioners can do. So that was really where it was exciting to see all the interest in science. So if we pull it all together, the way I like to say it is that 2020 became the year to start to STEM skepticism. And now we really need to advocate for STEM equity because people are primed. They seem ready and willing to do something about it, especially as these four key relationships have become evident from the results. First, I like to call it the science of health for the health of science. Honestly, with healthcare, in many ways, science gets personal. So our inherent interest in our own health, it provides a way in to attract people to science more generally. It also provides a strategy for building an ongoing healthy relationship with the scientific process. We can communicate that it is dynamic, that it relies on new data, and it relies on ongoing debate and discourse and discussion, and that's just how science works. And that's a great opportunity to do that so that people cannot politicize it easily. You know. Second is the technology and sociology of trust revelations. Trust in scientists has the highest and even corporations was high. So there's a clear opportunity for scientists and science-based companies to be visible, to be accessible and active in their advocacy so we can bolster that foundation of public trust in science. Third is the engineering of sustainable solutions. So during the pandemic, people saw images, you know, coming through on WhatsApp and other media showing images of nature thriving as humans took a pause. So it's not surprising that outside of healthcare, environmental impact remains the top concern. So now is not the time to put sustainable solutions on the back burner, but to show the critical role of science also in solving sustainability challenges. So it gives us a unique opportunity and not only to promote science for sustainability, but to attract underrepresented minorities to STEM and build a sustainable talent pipeline because there's a lot of research out there that shows that women and underrepresented minorities have a higher affinity to community-oriented goals, to more pro-social goals. And this is a very well researched and documented fact. So it's really a win-win. We have sustainability challenges that impact society. You want to do good things for society. Let's come together with science and make it happen. And finally, there's the math of equality and accountability. There's a uh, multiplier effect when everyone in the community comes together to solve common goals. And our survey results show that people mostly hold governments responsible uh, for solving societal issues associated with you know, health and sustainability and STEM equity. But our findings also show that the most positive impact likely happens with shared responsibility. It's when scientists and governments and business leaders and NGOs and academic institutions and individuals pull together in the pursuit of common goals. So the way we like to say it is that the pandemic pulse has really given science a lifeline of support. And now is the time to double down on our efforts to stem the skepticism, advocate for science and inclusive innovation with a focus on getting more STEM equity. And not too surprising that these themes continued in 2021. In fact, as we turn the corner on the pandemic and, and more vaccination in more countries or regions opening up, there's a sense of hope. And the world, 89% says science gives me hope for the future. And Germany is at 82% and compares well with the global average. So overall for 2021, hope is really the defining segment and sentiment and, and, and trust remains at the highest level. We already talked about that. There's a renewed focus on STEM because of the pandemic. We recognize the importance of science for solving sustainability challenges, and the public has an expectation of this shared responsibility, including expectations from corporations like ours. And much of this resonates in Germany as well, You know, just to highlight some points. Uh, Germans believe that science unifies people with differing opinions. The number for Germany was higher compared to the global average. We also see that you know, people agree that uh, younger generation is being inspired. This number was lower in Germany, and I'll dig into that a little deeper. Uh, Germans rate climate change is higher than the pandemic. They perhaps understand that the pandemic will be solved, but there are big challenges that we are not paying attention to. So a much more environmentally conscious society is still saying, I want solutions for climate change. I want solutions for ocean pollution, et cetera. So a lot of these messages resonate 
with the public that have overall sort of value that 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 very well compares. Now, if you dig deeper into that STEM data point, you will see that Germans agree that the world needs uh, more people pursuing STEM. And if you look at the numbers and you look at the younger generation, you realize that is the key because they are feeling much more inspired. Even in the environmental issues, the numbers are driven by the younger generation. So no surprise, but it needs to be stated. We need to do a lot more to keep this younger generation excited, engage, provide more exposure, and have them inspired for STEM because they, they are the future, as cliched as it sounds, but it is so important. And the data reflects that, especially for Germany. You know, STEM professionals and academics have a huge influence on shaping our world. And we need that diversity of thought and experiences we can get to creatively solve the problem. So we are doing a lot of things even at 3M. Uh, you know, when, when 55 million students in US alone transitioned to distance learning, how are we going to keep that science, uh, you know, curiosity and wonder alive? And so we thought about what we could do. You know, my colleagues at 3M were working on the masks and working to attack the pandemic from every angle and looking at collaboration. What can we do to make sure it does not impact the talent pipeline? So even during the pandemic, we kept up with our efforts and created the Science at Home series. And it's very interesting. We do some easy experiments that you can do with common household materials but we introduce some uh, you know, real scientific core principles to them. And, and, and it's one of those things that was very exciting even for us to do as we were stuck at home. So a diverse group of 3M scientists got together and did it. And I actually did the baking soda and vinegar experiment and blew up the balloon. It was super exciting because I have actually never done that experiment before. And I'm also so proud that last week 3M premiered a docu-series called Not the Science Type. And it intends to inform to influence and to inspire and to foster a conversation around shattering stereotypes. Because if you look at the data, you can clearly see that people agree that the world needs more people following STEM careers. People agree that we need to do a lot more to keep girls and women engaged. And we also see that it is important to have diversity in, in STEM. So, you know, science is important for our future. Innovation is important for science. Diversity is important for innovation. So the math really adds up and we have to do a lot more to, to, to shatter these stereotypes and excite ex and inspire more, more, more women. So this movie, and I, somebody can put the trailer in, in the chat and I can provide you the links and you can actually search it, search it online and you'll see. It's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. We, we, we show four women. We can all have different paths and backgrounds. Doesn't matter what your race or ethnicity or age or nationality, you can blaze trails, you can pursue your passions, you can bring in your interests, you can shape your careers, your potential is exponential. And I was honored to be one of the scientists feature in, featured in it. So it was a great experience last week. And personally, I'm also very excited that a book I wrote, which is kind of an uh, anecdotal compilation of my journey, it has sold enough copies to start the first scholarship for an underrepresented minority woman in STEM because all of the proceeds from the sales go for this cause. So at this time, at this moment in time, science is having its moment. And knowing that the image of science is improving because of a global uh, health crisis is certainly not a cause for jubilation. But the context behind the results from this year's study really suggests that science is now a prominent placement in the story of the pandemic. Science has been the hero in the forefront with preventative measures, with new treatments, with effective vaccines, all developed using sound data-driven scientific methodology by a diverse community of dedicated professionals. And we need to keep that momentum with issues that people care about the most. And we are proud that at 3M, we have been ab able to uncover what these issues are. The health of the global community, STEM equity, a path to sustainability and an expectation of shared responsibility. And that will allow the hero image continuity for science. And on that hopeful note, Thanks for the opportunity, Dank. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Yaishui. That was a um, tour de, and uh, and parcours it, um, a tour de force um, through your findings. Um, 
before, um, I have to say, um, I would have loved to have, um, when I was young um, and not being very, um, very, uh, let's say, prone to science, natural sciences, um, I wish there would have been women um, to look up to um, like there are today. Before um, we start um, with our panel discussion and before I introduce our panelists, there were a couple of questions though um, in um, the chat, which I would like to very quickly address with you. Um, and um, they are, um, uh, let me just sum it up. It's a question with regard to the methodology of the study, how many people were questioned. And if it's really, if we really can say the data is what it is, or if there's also a little bit of interpretation in there. So we had uh, uh, a third party conduct the research. It is 1,000 respondents per country. The number of countries is 14 to 17. And then during the pandemic pulse, it was only 10 because many countries were still in the lockdown. And the 1,000 people are chosen as a representation of the census data of that country. So it is an accurate demographic representation of that particular nation. Great, thank you so much. And I think everything can also be read up on, on the web page. Um, yes. The the study. Wonderful. Um, then let me introduce um, our panelists to you. Um, and um, if I may say so, we have another wonderful, excellent um, role model um, for female scientists, um, who is Camila Cruz Duerlacher. Um, Camila, you are Vice President, 3M Corporate R&D Operations, 3M Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So your portfolio is really, really big. Um, you have an amazing um, career. You are a chemist with a master's in polymer science. You have been working for 20 years for 3M. And what is your passion? Your passion is STEM. Um, so science, technology, energy, and um, engineering and mathematics and getting young people into STEM. Um, I hope I summed that up correctly, that that is your passion. It looked like that you are really trying to, trying to make a mark there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so wonderful to have you, um, Camila. Aaron is also with us today. Aaron Matt. Um, you are from our mother institute from Espen, um, United States, and um, Aaron has also a fantastic uh, career combining um, many different worlds. Um, Aaron is a biophysicist, um, also a science advocate, and you are, Aaron, a, a founding director of the Espen Institute Science and Society program, um, and you are just setting up a wonderful program looking at the health of basic science um, in different countries, um, also cooperating with Aspen Germany on that topic. Um, and um, you are um, not, just, not just a natural scientist, but also a political scientist. So we are very much also looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say to contextualize um, what's currently going on. Um, and um, our third panelist, um, it's a particular uh, pleasure, Yuri, to introduce you, um, Yuri Schneller is co-founder and managing director of Cosmonauts and Kings. And I just always have to say, I love that name. Um, the uh, first startup uh, for data-driven digital political communications in Germany. Um, and you have been entrusted with one of the most important campaigns currently for the Ministry of Health um, on pandemic management. Um, and we are certainly very much looking forward to hearing um, what uh, your personal experiences are. And um, uh, Yuri has held various positions um, in the digital campaigns of our Chancellor Merkel, Angela Merkel, uh, former EU Commissioner President uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, um, and many, many others. So there's um, a lot I hope you are going to share with us on communication also of science um, and political, the bridge between science and politics. Um, and I want to kick us off with a question or with an observation. We heard that this is the time of science. This is, this is the opportunity or people now believe more in science. And at the same time, 
there is so there there are still so many questions with regard to are masks really necessary or are they helpful to prevent pandemics? Um, there's the big question with regard to vaccination. Should I get vaccinated or shouldn't I vaccinate it? Um, is it safe to be vaccinated? Especially in Germany, there was the big question around some of the vaccinations, if they are, if, if, if they are safe. Um, so there seemed to be some kind of a contradiction. Um, on one hand side, a big belief in the importance and value of science, and then a big question mark um, with regard to how does it impact, impact me personally? So I want to, want to start um, with you, Aaron. Um, is there a contradiction or how, how do we get both of this together? How do we explain this? First of all, thank you so much for this invitation to be here today. It's an honor to join Aspen Germany across the ocean, one of our um, international affiliates, and also to be here with 3M, uh, with which the Science and Society program has recently partnered on an initiative that I might have a little bit of time to describe later on. Um, you raise a really important point about this discrepancy between this wonderful data that we're seeing about immense trust in science. I'm so heartened to see those statistics, but also in practice, how much uptake we have of recommendations that are actually based on the science. And I think we can look back at a lot of inconsistent messaging that happened, especially early on in the pandemic. Many people are going to die from it. Um, or what, sorry, many people won't die from it, but many people are. Don't travel, but due to an imminent travel ban, you need to get home as soon as possible. Stay inside, but fresh air is important. Wear a mask if you're symptomatic, but later on we said everyone should wear a mask. Hydroxychloroquine is a viable treatment, and then later on it wasn't. And these issues point to a widely held misconception about science that it offers an unequivocal answer to every scenario before us. And the problem is that the speeds at which science operate are actually really, really slow. Science relies on having ample data to make a st statistically significant claim about what we're seeing. It should undergo peer review and that process takes significant time. And the way that the public wanted to understand the emerging information about the virus and about the recommendations was not consistent with the pace that science operates. So it's not that science was wrong throughout all of this, but rather the process of science didn't lend itself to understanding the virus as rapidly as we needed to. And a good case study of this is the use of masks very early on in the pandemic. We didn't know about asymptomatic transmission. And the recommendation from the United States government was that you should only wear a mask if you were symptomatic. Then when the government said, okay, now everyone needs to wear a mask, that came across to a lot of members of the public as science being very inconsistent, science flip-flopping, but actually it's a lesson of science doing its job correctly. Following the data, as we learned that people could transmit the virus asymptomatically, we had a new recommendation that stemmed from, um, from the science. So I think that inconsistency between the data and trust and actually the practice are largely due to how we obtain information about the science itself and just the rapid, the rapid discrepancy, the, the large discrepancy between the pace. Camila, do you agree? Um, is it mainly the learning process and the communication leg or is there maybe more to it? Oh, I think uh, what, what we have seen right during this period is uh, that People are eager to learn more about science, are relying more on science, and, and Jay Shri just uh, showed us a lot of data. Um, and, and also one of the, the elements that um, also is embedded in that, in that study is that 67% of the, the people believe that science unifies uh, people with opposing views, right? So I think, as, as J. Shri just mentioned, right, there is a, a, a lasting benefit of this whole um, eagerness to understand more science, to make science more relatable. And I think it is also the, the role of scientists to make science more approachable, right? From, from both perspectives, uh, this will allow people to understand better science, to understand how science 
uh, affects their lives and also the benefits that science can bring. So it is very important that we, we are able to translate that very uh, technical language so that people really understand what we are talking about. And at the same time, a side benefit of that is that this way we will attract also more uh, yeah, the young generations right into science boys or girls, it's indifferent, but at the end of the day, we want people to be attracted to science. And the research has also shown this, that, that the more we have heard about science, the more uh, we have, there were so many podcasts, right, by infectologists. Uh, who would think that someone wants to hear an infectologist twice a week at <laughs> at a podcast talk about all this difficult science, right? But at the end of the day, people were eager for information. So we, we have to take advantage of this and, and bring it forward. Yuri, you are a communication uh, specialist. Um, and um, as we heard, um, not maybe not all of the communication in the beginning of the pandemic was so perfect was so perfect everywhere. Um, what, what is your take? Um, what did you learn from uh, the pandemic and how to communicate? Thank you. Uh, well, I think one big issue was that most governments around the world did not have the capacity, of course, to be prepared to communicate, uh, let's say, a pandemic situation properly to the population. Uh, I mean, this was what we found in Germany when, for instance, we got on board with the ministry They had three people in charge for digital communication. And within a week, matter of, I think, four weeks, they had to open up like six social media channels uh, and go to, let's say, completely new land with literally having no resources. So I think um, for the future and after the situation, definitely uh, a lot of governments will have to rethink, let's say, their entire information and communication infrastructure, um, how they communicate, let's say, health matters to the population. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> secondly, to, to do that on a much more uh, rapid scale than they have done in the past. Uh, because uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, there was such a, a, a low information side uh, when we talk about science, like what's actually going on. First, it was said, you know, like we don't need masks, then there was need masks. So there was often, and we had the same with the vaccine when there was the decision by the European bodies to, let's say, halt and pause the situation, uh, then to uh, restart it again. So, of course, this was kind of like throwing a bomb into a vaccine campaign, right? If you stop it and then you start it again, and uh, it was said it should, you know, supposedly uh, strengthen uh, the, the, the trust in science, but it actually showed like that didn't really turn out to be true. So a lot of people feel like... Um, this this is uh, essential and i think one uh, further element is the fragmentation of the media consumption as well um we have seen one crucial driver for mis and disinformation uh, being uh, closed social messaging so be it on signal freema whatsapp uh, uh, telegram especially uh, playing a vital role um uh, you know with with all the anti vaccine uh, movements and also conspiracy theorists really thriving in in this pandemic moving away from the traditional mainstream media even further and uh, basically entering a completely unchecked uh, uh, news realm. And uh, I mean, platforms are starting to, to take action on that, but I think in on a lot of areas it was yeah, way too slow. And uh, like uh, we discovered, for instance, with the Ministry of Health, the, the BMG opened up a, a Telegram channel. They have now over half a million uh, subscriber, which is now the largest, let's say, governmental um, uh, news channel. Uh, so people really picked up the information, but it's um, really hard. And then I want to make a second point that besides this fragmentation, it also comes down to attention, because um, <clears throat> as it was mentioned in uh, in, the, in the talks from from the colleagues before, that of course uh, trust overall has increased, but the problem still remains that attention span overall has decreased. Uh, so uh, science, of course, uh, similar to politics, has the issue that is rather complex in its, um, let's say, in its substance. And, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to explain like how a vaccine against COVID works in, in less than 15 seconds in an Instagram story, but you need to get somehow the attention of the user in order to get them into a funnel or an engagement cycle where you 
so let's start build up on that and once you gain the attention like move them somewhere where they can get more information um, and uh, follow up on that so um, building up let's say information and attention uh, has has definitely from a practical side been the most challenging one because uh, whereas at the beginning, people, you know, looked all over to, to get more information on COVID, we could see that it rapidly decreased in this year, where people more and more were kind of fed up with uh, COVID once it appeared on their screen. And uh, when they saw information from the ministry with updated ways to protect yourself, like right now in the summer vacations, like people are not paying that much attention anymore as it was in the beginning. So how to keep up, let's say, attention and developments in, in science uh, is, I think, definitely a, uh, a challenging part in the um, communication flow for any governmental institution. And if I may make a comment, Stormy, the way, you know, if you really think about trust, trust is such a fluid concept and it's such a personal concept. And you never know how it comes. But one thing is there is that relationships build trust. And if you don't have an ongoing relationship with science, how can you possibly trust it? So, you know, I don't hold it against the people, but it is the responsibility somehow to bring together that relationship so there is some trust. So it, as it played out, the more I think about it, it wasn't just about science. It was about the practice of science and the practitioners. It wasn't just about the politics, it was also the policies. And it wasn't just about the people, it was the perceptions. And so all of that came together. And hopefully that we are better off now because we have built this relationship that shows that this is exactly how science works. As Aaron pointed out, that's science at work right now that it played out. So hopefully the public will be more engaged now and understand. Um, when I prepared for our uh, seminar today uh, and I looked at quote, a quote, I found another one which I really loved and it says, uh, well, a scientist is a person who made all the mistakes uh, he could, he or she could make in his field. Um, and um, that's my next question to all, all, all four of you is, um, how should scientists deal with mistakes? Um, and how should that be communicated? Um, and also policymakers. Um, for example, I remember um, when there was um, this Länder Beschluss and um, over the public holidays um, and Merkel afterwards, Yuri said, no, that was actually a mistake and we are going to do it differently. Um, it, it seems to be valued that she admitted there was a mistake, but is it, is it really possible to admit as a scientist and in communications to a mistake, or does this, is this going to lead to mistrust? And I want to ask you first, Yuri, because, um, well, I mean, you have a lot of experience, again, with communication um, and also with changes in strategies. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can keep it very brief. I mean, one practical example was, as I just mentioned, for instance, the, the vaccination decision by the European board definitely blew, let's say, our communication efforts, uh, uh, because, you know, like, I think from a scientific uh, standpoint, it makes absolute sense to, of course, follow decision and halt uh, something like that or uh, uh, make various decisions. But from a communication or political standpoint, everything is much more connected. Uh, if you throw one uh, stone here, then it has an implication on the other side. Uh, so many people could not understand why, for instance, science uh, uh, or like the German um, research there was no much evidence on how the situation is in schools like is it now effectious is it not what kind of protective measures do you need to take in terms of um, you know air conditioner protective ways or to wear masks in school or whatsoever so there was a lot of insecurity and, and I think for um, politics itself you could see that uh, well given the, the German circumstance they were very good in micromanagement but it didn't really lead it up to a picture where you could say like this is now the way where we're going this is the road that we had it like, for instance, the Biden administration said, okay, in the hun first 100 days, we're gonna vaccinate so and so many people. This is what we gotta do. This is our the steps to, to do it. And I think we could see in Germany where maybe the trust in science has increased, the trust in political capacity to manage such a pandemic. Uh, Germans were always, uh, when we look to the world saying, look, I mean, at least uh, our buses run on time and, and things work out properly. Like this image has, got a lot of cracks uh, in this pandemic going from how the situation was in schools even to the the vaccine management at the beginning so uh, and from a just communication point as a politician of course you have the problem that um, uh, when you just listen to let's say uh, 
scientists and not also to maybe uh, uh, communicative layers, uh, like we would have a different situation with the vaccine program. Like uh, at the beginning, we had in Berlin uh, week per week, you know, hundreds of open spots with AstraZeneca because people just said, oh no, I want to wait for BioNTech because this is like the third level. And the number one conversation you have these days in Germany is, oh, are you already vaccinated? Oh, what did you get? Oh, you just got uh, AstraZeneca. Oh, yeah, sorry for you. Like I got the good stuff. <laughs> you know, and I think this is a very privileged discussion. It took a lot of effort and uh, to say it from a social media perspective, like it also, when you look at the comments and so on, like this perception in the head starts right from the beginning. People said, okay, you know, we have different vaccines and there's a bad vaccine and there's a good vaccine. Uh, and like cracking that early enough in the process is really, really uh, hard. And it takes joint effort from science, but also from politics and media to all have a, uh, uh, let's say, um, joint responsibility when it comes to really inform and educate uh, the people. I mean, luckily now we have enough, but there was a time when it really looked badly that people just didn't want to get uh, Astra, for instance, and the German government bought a lot of that stuff. Uh, so um, yeah, that was definitely an issue. And the same question also to, to you, uh, Camila, how to deal with mistakes? So I, I would uh, first answer with um, one of the principles that guides uh, innovation in uh, R&D, research and development in 3M, right? We have um, our, what we call the McKnight principles. McKnight was uh, one of our CEOs um, for, for a long period and he, he um, he wrote some principles that we that guide our work until today. And one of them is that during the, the effort, the R&D effort, mistakes will be made. And, and it is acceptable to do mistakes. It's part of the, the, the innovation process, of the creation process. But what I, what I, uh, what I think is that um, although we had had pandemics before, we had never had, had a pandemic to the scale that we had this time. So all the learnings, all the preparations that we had done had, had not prepared us to the scale of the pandemic we had today. So at the end of the day, I think Aaron said that before, we have a lot of science being created at the same time that we are reviewing them, assessing them and, and identifying whether they work or not. So it's not, we, we haven't had really time to do the right science or the good science, right? Science has a process. You create it, you test it, you assess, and you verify, and then you are certain that science worked. We didn't have the luxury of time this time. So we had to, you know, like try medicines and then discard them or try the vaccine and then see what the side effects are. At the end of the day, we have never done things so fast and it's great because we're learning we we as as a community we have learned we can do things maybe in a faster way in some things we're learning also other things not to do like yuri just explained the the issue with the vaccine in germany um but it it's part of the good science that you will not get it right every time you will have a lot of failures before you get the, the right one and the best one. Could I add a little bit to this also? Yes, um, <laughs> and I'm going to answer this based on my early career working in basic research in physics and biology. Science is a tremendous honor system, especially in academic research. When a paper gets submitted for peer review, the reviewing scientists do not repeat the experiments that were done. They're trusting on good faith that the data presented are what the scientist authors say they are. If they say we mixed this reagent with this cell type, they have to believe it. That's how science works. So I think it's extremely important for us to uphold that honor system by proactively being honest about when there is a mistake and explaining publicly to the scientific community and the broader community what brought about that error. And it could be something about an early career scientist fabricated data to advance his or her career. We need to talk about why that's happening 
in the scientific profession in order for us to uphold the honor system that allows science to function as well as it does. And as Camilla mentioned, it's subjected to a long process of continual review. Eventually those experiments will get redone by subsequent scientists who wanna build on that finding and say, okay, well, here's the next step, but I need to go check this one thing and oh, that didn't actually work. And then the hypotheses get revised, but that can't happen very quickly in a pandemic, obviously. Um, so again, this is what I keep saying about how important it is to convey to the public. This is how science is done. It's a slow process. We can try to expedite matters like peer review in an emergency situation like a pandemic, but then there will be mistakes that happen along the way. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to remind our audience that you can uh, raise your hand uh, because we are getting close to the Q&A um, set section of our um, event and you can do so by going um, to the little reaction button and if you I know that you're all zoom experts but just as a reminder um, under that reaction button you find the electronic hand which you can raise and you can also um, certainly also use the chat function for the discussion but I want to ask one last question before I open it up for the discussion and that is um, a question with regard to responsibility um, a lot of one of you mentioned um, that there are now lots of podcasts um, on the pandemic, on vaccination. Um, there are a lot of scientists are on social media, having a huge followership um, and um, providing a lot of um, information. And um, scientists have also become communicators and they have become influencers. So where does the um, responsibility for how information is used start for a scientist and where does it end? And are scientists actually, are they prepared um, to take up this role? And since you are already shaking your head, Aaron, um, or, or smiling at least, let's start with you. I have a lot to say about this one, but I'll keep it brief because I want to hear the other panelists' views. I believe all scientists are, have a moral public obligation to further their work publicly by communicating what it means and what its value is. Most scientific research, especially in the United States, is funded by taxpayer dollars. So there is that inherent payback to the public of communicating to them what the science was about. At the same time, scientists are rarely trained in how to do that properly. They're taught to think extremely abstractly. They're taught to think statistically. They're, th they're taught to think with every exception in mind. And those aspects make for very bad public communication. It's not effective to tell someone what it means, to tell someone, oh, one in 600,000 people had this side effect. That doesn't mean a lot to someone. It doesn't mean, will I get it? Do I wanna be that one? Instead, it needs to be about the benefit for that particular treatment outweighing the very minuscule risk. I wish there were more mechanisms in place for scientists, especially in academia, to get that kind of training. Um, and there are a lot of, what I'm what really excited about, and this is part of what Jay Shree, 3M and the Aspen Institute are working on building, is there's tremendous energy among young scientists to do that kind of work. They're saying, even though we really need to focus on our lab work, we also see this moral obligation to the public. We wanna get involved in science policy and science communication. So I'm seeing younger generations being really good at this, um, but I, I, I do think it needs to happen, but it has to happen well, if it's going to be so. What do you, um, since you have already turned off uh, your mute button, Yai Shui, um, what, <laughs> what's your take on it? I, I couldn't agree more. I really think that it is a responsibility that people have. And whether you're in academia or a corporate uh, scientist or a researcher like I am, I think it is very important to be able to communicate the human context of what you're doing. And if you get in the habit of communicating the human context, it might even change how you think about certain things how you think about your products, how you think about your innovations, how you think about how sustainability and societal issues are interwoven into it. When you're not answerable to society by any way, you just won't think about that. And what the pandemic has shown us, and I'll give you the spiel, I believe the real shtick is STEM, science, humanities, technology, engineering, and math. 
And that is very essential for all scientists to have that ability to communicate with a human context of what they're doing. You agree, Camila? How can I disagree with J3? That that's uh, it, it's unexistent. <laughs> yeah, but I, I I would maybe go back to um, on uh, from a different lens, right? The the role uh, scientists play. So one of the things that the the research also uh, showed uh, is that everyone has a role to play, and the expectations of people is that starts with teachers. Right, they they are the ones that have, let's say, the primary role in advocating STEM and in in um, in inspiring, right, the next generation to pursue STEM, and then governments and then corporations. But we we all have been in academia. We have all had very good teachers and professors, and those who were maybe not uh, the best ones, and. Many of us got inspired to go into science uh, or into the careers that we have chosen because we have very inspirational uh, teachers or professors. So I, I believe even that part of, of the role of communicating science, right, in, in teaching, in, in sending the message starts at an, a very early age through the work of, uh, of teachers at schools. And Yuri, um, you work with a lot of, um, I mean, you're an influencer yourself, right? Um, no? <laughs> um, where would, I mean, if when you're communicating on issues yourself, um, do, you, do you question yourself what you should write to whom you should write, um, what, what your response, do you do every time this reflection process? Uh, yes, but I'm also well trained. <laughs> That's what I <laughs> teach the politicians. No, but I, I think uh, what it was mentioned earlier. I think what Aaron said is very important to have this kind of uh, uh, responsibility that this is a very sensitive matter, and of course to 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 communicate that. But however, of course the cr critical issue is time. Uh, same for goes for scientists, like for politicians, right? Like when you're continuously communicating when it's actually time to do the research and to do the job. So I think it's rather important to focus on the substance and what matters and be transparent about the methodology and how it's developed and how, uh, yeah, <clears throat> just how the overall process of your, your research works and what the key findings uh, were. But of course, um, uh, I also think that the science community itself with, uh, uh, let's say all the uh, politicization of many areas also has a lot of discussion to face right how how neutral are you and how open uh, to to debates like for instance we saw uh, uh, the Sputnik 5 uh, vaccine uh, they ran a huge uh, social campaign also included paid a lot of researchers across Europe to communicate and to let's say build trust on the Sput Sputnik vaccine and uh, increase detrust on, on other vaccines so of course Science is also always subject to, uh, let's say, communication manipulation uh, from foreign governments or from uh, influence. So, um, and you could even argue that uh, companies uh, might sometimes use it. If I think about the Facebook Institute for Ethics in Munich, where there was a lot of debate because they, the researchers, they, they were not really free on what to publish on social media, for instance, funnily, although they were there involved, like there were a lot of guidelines um, so I think that uh, the best way for science to communicate is uh, what you said, Aaron, who like pays the studies, where is, what is it funded, what is the methodology, and to be very transparent and use the tools of social media to do that. Um, I think that helps, let's say, uh, make it easier to debunk uh, uh, fake, fake news and myth theories that sometimes spurl out there and that we had to cope with in, in, in this pandemic, where there was just often... The, the, the main subject of disinformation campaigns was uh, criticizing the methodology or the, the scientists themselves that they were not really uh, doing this properly and then always coming up with some alternative facts. So I think this is one of the key things when communicating um, yeah, subjects like that. And I just want to respond to some things that I'm seeing in the chat. Um, I, I said there, and Jayshree agreed about this responsibility that scientists have to do this kind of communication work. At the same time, there are time constraints. And I don't believe that every scientist needs to be on Twitter or Instagram 
conveying how important their science is. But I think part of the training should be to understand the societal context of that science and to be able to explain it even in an anecdotal setting with family and friends. Some of the most important advocacy work happens on that individual level. And also I think that has a positive feedback on the scientist's work as Jayshree mentioned. I think the more that scientists engage with non-scientists, even just conversationally, the more fluid they're gonna to get to be talking about why their work matters. And I remember when I moved from a university town for my PhD, to New York City, I had so many interactions where I met people who said they had never met a scientist before. And that was a tremendous responsibility I had to convey what it is, what it means to be a scientist. And I, that, that was wonderful training for me to become a better communicator about the role that science has. I would now also like to bring in our audience. And I saw that um, Juliana and Victoria, you were having an intense chat um, in the chat um, on the responsibility also of media. And so I would like to give um, Victoria first the floor and then um, Juliana, if you also want to uh, jump in, I would love to hear from you as well. Okay, hello to everybody. I'm Victoria Rodinkova, as you can see from Ukraine, and also I'm a Fulbright Scholar and um, member of Aspen Society, local uh, Aspen Society. And in my past life, let's say like this, I was a journalist. I'm biology by my education, but I started my career as a journalist and was the chief editor of daily newspaper and the director of the informational agency. And then I shifted to science. And my science is doing the pollen forecasts for Ukraine, and now I am a leader of this uh, the direction, let's say scientific direction in Ukraine, and I provide our um, uh, audience with the pollen forecast. And uh, being a, a journalist, I establish it with some people with business, and this is very important when we speak about private and, uh, uh, like, say, governmental uh, initiative. This is completely private initiative to provide uh, people with the inf information about allergy and and pandemics. I turn it my website in a state of informational agency and I uh, as I uh, can um, speak English I took all the newest data and translated into the Ukrainian and provided people with the newest data and we did a lot of infographics and it was very nice for me to see that my infographics have to wash the hands properly when uh, printed and placed it in schools under the this uh, I don't know these tools for uh, making the sanitizing hands for the children so they even used our logo uh, and provided this information for them. So also it was very important to uh, make, uh, because we have at pandemics very rising uh, fair, as you said, and our um, uh, uh, social uh, initiative was to calm down this fair as uh, Betula pollen, as birch pollen uh, was underway, and this is the main reason of pollen allergy at the same time when pandemic started. So uh, our property, uh, not governmental property, but our property was calmed down a situation and explained that people, folks, this is not uh, coronavirus, this is just birch allergy, and you have this because the symptoms are very similar, you know, and people experience it uh, uh, um, rhinitis and uh, some fever, uh, no, no fever, not uh, very much, but rhinitis and some eyes and cough probably sometimes. So we made an inf infographics also to show what is the difference between the coronavirus symptoms and symptoms of the uh, pollen allergy and so on. And we kept this uh, walk for a very long time. And uh, as we also be uh, represented in the uh, Facebook, in the Instagram, also we shared this infographics in the social media. So it was very much responsibility to take uh, and uh, inform people about the difference, uh, inform people to make, uh, calm them down. I understand that allergy is not exactly the, uh, let's say, coronavirus, but uh, we made a lot of uh, um, stories about vaccine. I translated WHO information about what how vaccine is done, what the differences between vaccines. So we did all of this information as I could. I just became a journalist and uh, uh, as I could, I provided this all for the people just to explain, to uh, um, to let them understand and so on. So, so I applied my journalistic experience 
experience now to explain science. And besides this, in the common way, without pandemics, I am explaining people what uh, plants are allergenic, what are not allergenic, what uh, you, uh, what allergens are now around you. I'm writing pollen forecasts every week, and uh, people can find them on the website, and people can uh, like. Um, uh, subscribe, be a subscribers. I have seven uh, thousand and half uh, and five hundreds of subscribers now. <laughs> pollen forecast and so on. Thank so you. this is this is my speech. So I, I'm trying to speak very quickly just to provide as much information as I can. Thank no, you. No, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, and for pointing us at where we can find um, more information. Um, and on, on the before I uh, turn it back to our panelists. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, Juliana Popescu if you want to jump in because you also said something about the um, responsibility of um, media. Hello, hi. Do you hear me? Yeah, we yes, can hear hi. you. Hi, everyone. I think we are talking about this um, subject on from two different points of view and two different uh, environments, if you if you if I can say. Um, I did actually, uh, I, I was talking actually with Victoria uh, in the chat, but um, I think she's more journalist probably. Um, I am scientist 100%. When you're a scientist and you're a researcher, especially in the United States, um, you are all the time, you have to be actually all the time involved in, in your research work. Otherwise, you know, the pandemics didn't stop research in the United States, even we have oh, so many problems. Um, for instance, I had to, 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 to publish four papers, two, uh, two um, projects, two grants actually, to, to write two grants, especially for two students also. So um, I'm doing also the science communication part uh, because also, I was journalist, especially at the beginning of my career. Basically, I'm a pharmacist, and I was involved in science communication and journalism, medical journalism and medical writing at the beginning of my career, which was a long time ago in Romania. Um, now, during this pandemic, um, I came actually for a couple of months in Romania, um, and I tried to do something also for the people in Romania, but the problem is that um, I saw this part of um, fake science and um, misinformation all over the uh, media, TV, everything. Um, and what the, the problem is that we don't have to make a confusion between you know being involved in research uh, in, in science communication and science communicator and being influencers. Um, what I saw, influencers are in general pro, pro, per persons or personalities. They are all over um, on every TV channels. They are invited at every uh, you know. Um, uh, talks every uh, everything it's everywhere they are very active also on internet on social media etc for me for instance i cannot keep up with this because i'm also involved in research so of course i'm a trustful person because i come from the research part but i cannot keep up and i cannot compete with these influencers that are actors mm -hmm. or just you know um uh, people having this kind of job because they get money from from their websites or from you know they involve on with the media so i cannot do that for sure i did all this stuff by just by volunteering and not being paid of course i just make it as part of my you know um i was thinking that i have to do this it's part of my uh, job also to communicate science and uh by the way in the united states at, at the very beginning of the pandemic we had a group we had more than 350 people involved from scientists, from scientists to science communicators, all from universities from all around uh, United States. We made a kind of group, it was called an, an initiative, it was a task force, uh, the name was Ask a Scientist. And in this way, we involved people coming from science, real research to explain um different you know uh, stuff related to the pandemic to and now with the vaccines and everything so it was not allowed to every person coming from different you know uh i don't know actors uh, uh footballists etc <laughs> to explain something even clinicians i saw a lot of clinicians uh well it's okay mm -hmm. 
a good word to have clinicians or infectionists or people coming from the hospital to explain, but it's a limit. Somewhere you have to be trustful and to explain how the vaccine works. Uh, I saw people coming from, you know, uh, because they're very trustful just because they are mm -hmm. very popular. Scientists like us, we are in the lab in general. Nobody trusts us because nobody knows what I'm, we're <laughs> doing. We are not popular. We are not, you know, a, a fancy media or something. So that's why I want to say that we are not, you cannot be in this both situation very well. You can, I, can I react to, to that quickly? Um, sure. And then I want to ask. I disagree, yeah. Um, what I want to say is I, I would love to see in the future more incentives in place for scientists to take on that kind of work. Right now, at least in the United States, the tenure process does not reward a lot of public outreach or engagement. And I'd love to see that change, especially, and I think that's an opportunity from the COVID pandemic is to see how important that kind of work is. And I'd actually like to ask Jay Shri how 3M created time for you to do this kind of work valuing just, it alongside just one your... second Aaron because you said about New York your experience in New York is very different I'm coming from Kentucky Kentucky is very different from you know big mm. states and you have this problem in every southern country uh, states of United States people do not trust so much in science it depends if you have a big state if you have a big university there mm. if you have a kind of very big city like New York is different so it's very different if we have to compare between states and thank you very much <laughs> yeah thank you so much for sharing your experience I really since our time is running running out I really want to um, go back to our panelists to give them the I see that Victoria you also want to add something but maybe you can maybe no 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 maybe you can write it down in the chat function and then we pick it up um, in the discussion because otherwise I fear that we won't get to our panelists again and answer what you've already discussed. I also want to throw in the issue, um, since both of you, Victoria um, and also Juliana mentioned it, how to counter fake news, um, how you do this also as a scientist. And uh, Yashui, um, since Aaron di directly addressed you, let's, uh, let's continue with you. Yeah, I think it was a great discussion on what you felt as a personal responsibility and you stepped in to do it. I completely agree with Aaron that this needs to become part of not just church work, but real work, because the chasm between science and society, it just builds if we don't have these connections as part of an evaluation process and an ongoing process, because back to the point, trust comes from relationships. And if we don't have relationships, we won't have trust. Gone are the days when people are going to say, I'm just going to do it because hair doctor said that, you know, it's, it's just not going to be that. Uh, the point I also want to make is, uh, on the flip side, we also have to teach people to be more critical thinkers. Mm. Because I appreciate the point where you've got people who are superstars and they're coming out and saying, I'm just not going to take the vaccine or this or that. And then you have a mass following because people think, oh, there you go. That superstar who's very good looking said it. It's like, pfft. Right. So I think we have to make sure that we're also teaching critical thinking because the world has gotten to a point where it is very difficult to navigate and it is very easy. And I think you mentioned that is very easy to mislead people because they are not critically thinking. And once you build into that fear and uncertainty, your brain is just ready to believe in anything with complete certainty because it gives you the reassurance. So we have a perfect storm brewing where misinformation and fake news can become real very fast for people. So I think the best way is to have your transparency and teaching and relationship through the process of science, building more critical thinking and more regulations and governance into who can talk about what and try to sway people. I think that whole thing is yet another big ball of wax that needs to be sort of figured out where just people can become influencers, start saying something, it's suddenly freedom of speech and now you're misleading so many people. Where is the governance? What is your platform? What are you allowed to say? Those kinds of things have to also come together because, I, and I'm speaking not as a scientist, I'm speaking as a average part of the society or average public because there are lots of things that I don't understand anything about, but I can go through the process of critical thinking because of the background that I have. How are we teaching an average person to learn that same process of trust? Who do you trust? 
How are what are credible sources? How do you find out what are credible sources and go look for that before looking at something and going, oh my gosh, this is what happened. And this is a constant social process that I go back to Aaron's point of individual responsibility. I get a lot of stuff from my family in India that is just going around in WhatsApp and I and my brother, I see, we typically always say, do not forward this. This is not real. Here's how it, you can tech and here's how it shows this is not real. And slowly we see people are getting afraid of literally me and my brother because we'll jump on people and say, do not forward this. You know, this is all family. But I think it's important to take that step at an individual level to say, do not forward fake news because this can have some very serious lasting consequences. Thank you so much. Before I hand over to Camila and Yuri, um, I do want to give the floor to Marlies. Uh, Marlies is our student assistant um, who helped to prepare this event. And she did so from Moscow, where it's currently very hot and um, her computer overheated. And she put the computer, creative as we all are, into the fridge. So she has been following us from the open fridge. And um, Marlies, can you ask your question uh, in person um, or do you want me to read what you, uh, what you wrote in the chat? No, I'll definitely try. I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I'm sorry I'm not turning on my camera. As I have mentioned, I am half in the fridge at the moment. We have- <laughs> I have to say that is so cool. <laughs> um, so no, but I wanted to ask, um, so I am German American and I've been studying here in Russia now and um, generally here people are not getting vaccinated because they just highly mistrust the government. And I just wanted to ask if any of you see specific measures that our cooperation amongst governments could take in order to help like work against the mistrust we see here because obviously people are reading things here, they have a certain narrative that they already believe. Um, so maybe you have specific ideas on what we can also help to do, maybe from somewhere else, um, to help tackle the mistrust that we see in other societies, because obviously it's a privilege for us to have, you know, um, access to information and to different um, inputs. So um, yes, that will be my question. And I hand over to Camila. Okay. So I, I have to go to get very personal now because I'm Brazilian and you all are seeing what is happening in Brazil. So this past Saturday, we reached half a million deaths, right, caused by COVID. And I see that governments have the responsibility in the role of leading us through this. Uh, so I, I relate to the question that you were making, and what if the government is the one that is actually um, spreading the fake news? Right, so I, I, I would love to hear from Yuri because I don't have the answer because my own country is now suffering because we have a government who actually thinks uh, hydroxychloroquine is the solution. Everyone should take it. And now doctors are proving that people are dying from diseases caused by taking too much hydroxychloroquine um, and also saying people shouldn't um, distance, shouldn't wear masks. So it is important to have policies and regulations, but who then has the governance of, of a country when the, the government actually is um, on the, the contra, contrary wave, right? So I, I, I am more willing to hear from uh, maybe Yuri who works uh, directly with politics, then, then I have an answer for this because I keep asking myself because they, they also made a huge campaign, right? And, and we know other governments who did the same saying that the World Health Organization could not be trusted and what they say is also wrong. So how do we influence, right? How do we change this within countries? Yuri, what an easy question for you, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but would I have an answer for that? I think, uh, you know, I could, I could touch much higher uh, uh, bills than right now. Um, no, but uh, in all honesty, I think that um, one thing certainly it, it starts all with uh, media literacy and uh, uh, media competency uh, starting early on. This is something that we still have managed in all Western countries to include in our educational programs. Uh, and it is one of the crucial aspects that 
uh, uh, you know, be it Deloitte or others have all uh, identified as one of the key, let's say, core skills that differentiate us from the robots uh, in, in 30, 40 years to come is the ability to uh, separate, let's say, um, aspects and elements uh, true from false and just creative and abstract thinking. So I think this is something in the long term, which we should tackle now, though, um, and, and start really implementing it in our educational system, because um, uh, just how the way you perceive information, what is true, what is false, it's still not really uh, mandatory in the school programs and should be definitely implemented in, in, in our educational system. And in the short term, I um, uh, well, what we have managed in the beginning and really work on with uh, the current campaign Ermel Hoch is that we included a lot of uh, social, political, uh, sport, entertainment influencers that they share broadly that they get vaccinated, which to be honest is just a, 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 a zip of water on the hot stone, but it's uh, it was a start that we could see, especially on channels like TikTok or others where you know, government doesn't really have any reach to at least uh, see the people, their idols, idols, their people they follow and they put more trust in that they get vaccinated. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I think the problem with, with COVID especially was that a lot of the, uh, as you just mentioned, uh, with your government or a lot of other governments, of course, have used it to strengthen their own uh, political uh, position and their agenda in order to showcase it as a kind of a Western uh, somehow ideology. I mean, if we rethink back in the days how Trump tried to blame it all to China. Um, and I think this uh, uh, we will see uh, this increasing in the future because uh, uh, the pandemic situation now after, after COVID, I mean, uh, we still do not as Europeans have the capacity in the infrastructure if another pandemic would hit us, who would pay for it? How do we build up an infrastructure where if we think back in the early days, it was wild, wild west. Uh, I mean, literally American, uh, uh, you know, governmental official went around with cash books and like bought all the masks that were available. I mean, it was uh, uh, complete insane. And I think for the trust, especially in the in in international institutions, such as the WHO, or uh, others, uh, there sh we should uh, implement a plan how we distribute it more um, accessibly. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, our time is already up. Um, there are still some really interesting uh, comments in the chat function, um, for example, by uh, Julia. Um, lots of interesting data. Unfortunately, I can't give you the floor anymore, Julia. Um, but uh, take a look at the chat function. It's, it's really interesting um, what Julia wrote to us and Victoria again as well. Um, I want to end how I started with a quote. Um, and the quote reads as follow. Your assumptions are your windows into the world. Scrub them off every once in a while or light won't come in. And that's a quote by Isaac Asimov. And this is what I want to ask our um, panelists for the concluding round, very quick. What's your, what was your essential assumption during the pandemic, which you scrubbed off? And I would like to start with Yashwi. Wow, if I understand this question right, you're asking what is it that you thought and, and, and what it is that, that was different that happened. Yes. Um, I honestly thought that we were all going to get it. And uh, I didn't think that you could socially distance and isolate yourself effectively. I just didn't think that we could do that. I didn't think work could go on. I didn't think, you know, our lives would go on. And uh, it's incredible that the human resilience we have shown during this time that life did go on, we did struggle through it, we did survive, we managed to, you know, cocoon ourselves, and we had the privilege to do so. So the biggest thing that it revealed to me was my own pockets of privilege. That was my biggest thing. And that's why the book and that's why all the efforts that I made is because I realized, oh, my God, you are so privileged. And what can you do for others? So biggest thing that revealed. Thank you so much. Erin, which of your assumptions did you scrub off? I was extremely optimistic that we would have it under control by September of 2020. I remember getting 
news in February that it had moved from East Asia to Italy. And I was on the verge of organizing a conference there with um, one of the participants who was here earlier, Angelo Petroni, the head of Aspen Italia, and having to undo all that. And we rescheduled it for September, thinking we could bring people from a hundred, <laughs> thinking we could bring people from 50 countries to Italy in September. So um, just realizing that this was a long war that is still going on. You, which assumption did you scrub off? Um, well, I I personally hope that the, this pandemic would create a situation for a lot of people like in World War II, which, I mean, enabled the European Union and a lot of international institutions that this was create a moment where would bring, let's say, people together and make us humans realize that the virus doesn't have any uh, national borders and that we're all sitting in the same boat. But uh, let's say the actions and uh, developments in most countries uh, since then have not really shown that we managed to uh, either uh, yeah, strengthen international organizations or increase uh, cooperation on large scale after this pandemic. But I hope uh, I might be wrong, but uh, yeah, that, that was something I would I was hoping would get much faster done. Thank you so much. And Camila, which well, is for me, besides many of the other comments, which I also thought, um, the one that wasn't mentioned is that I never thought we, we would be so accustomed and so used to using uh, electronics uh, tools for working like Zoom and Teams. And we were just introducing Teams. People were getting used to the tool. Now all are experts in, in using those tools. And I use it to communicate with my family. We have weekly Zoom meetings, which, which is interesting because I wasn't doing this before, right? Although I was living here and they were there, I, I now, because of the pandemics, I talk to my mom every day on FaceTime. So things that were there were available, but we were just not using because I don't know why we were we have hadn't learned and we didn't know they were we were capable of using them. And now we use it all the time, and it's so normal that we don't even think about this anymore. Thank you so much. Um, what this event has shown to me is there are lots of questions to be asked. There still remains a lot to be done. Um, it is very productive getting people together from different countries and from different policy fields. And it makes a lot of sense to question our assumptions, to let the light in. Um, and as Marie Curie said, to understand um, and to fear less. And uh, what I'm, I go out here a little less fearful because I know there are lots of people who are also fearless um, and advance our thinking. Um, and with this, I want to thank our panelists for sharing your knowledge, your experience. It's been a great pleasure and great fun. Thank you so much. And we will continue this uh, conversation with um, our friends in Aspen, uh, US, and hope to see all of you again soon. And thank you so much for 3M, 3M for the cooperation. We will continue. See you later, stay healthy, and have a very good summer. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.